Previously on Living with a Rotary, I revealed my awesome new 650 pound Mazda RX-8 that even came with a free sock. The following week, I took the 8 to Surrey Rolling Road to get the car dynoed. It didn't go well. Yeah, Wow. With the engine in bad health, I then limped the car to Rotary Revs for a compression test and full engine teardown. Again, I was met with more bad news. Yeah, that's um. Okay, <laughs> that's the technical term, is it? Uh, yeah. Proper, well and truly. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get started, here's a look at the new engine that will be going in Felix, the name you chose for this glorious car in our recent poll. And now, it's time to reveal the winner of the rotor and rotor housing that I showed you last week. So congratulations to... Bofnita Alba Editia Vaslui. Because you, my friend, are now the owner of the most awesome desk ornament. Welcome back to episode number four of Living with a Rotary. I'm back here at Rotary Revs and to my left is Josh. Uh, yeah, good to see you, man. You good? good? Yeah, glad to have you back. Excellent. Thanks very much. You've been a very busy boy, haven't you? Because behind us is the car's old engine. I say old because most of it's new now. Uh, <laughs> tell us, what have you been up to in the week that we've been gone? Everything looks really shiny and new. As we discussed when you were last here, your e-shaft was gone, um, mainly because the rotor had spun on it. You also had some dodgy looking ports on the irons. You got New front and rear iron. We kept the center iron just because it was in a good usable condition and uh, the ports hadn't been touched. We also had new housings. We've got some lovely looking rotors as well, don't we? Hi. Let's have a look at these. These are all nice and Vaselined up. And uh, again, uh, one of these is actually original from the car. That's right, that's the one you're holding right there. We've cleaned off all the carbon in all the seal channels on the rotor faces and replaced the bearing. And then we put new O-rings in the oil control rings, as well as new springs underneath them. And put new side seals in and new corner seals. We clearance the uh, side seals, which Perfect. is anything tighter than 0.4 of a mil. And the apex seals will be going in when we put the engine together, is that correct? That's right, yeah. Let's have a look at the irons and tell me, what have you done here? We don't have a bridge port. That was actually my decision because you recommended that we avoid it because we're going to be doing hypermiling at some point. Also, for reliability, it's better probably not to go bridge port. How did you uh, street port this? And how, again, remind us, how is it different to bridge porting? Right, so a street port is basically using existing ports and uh, enlarging them just a little bit more. You uh, extend the port opening duration on the intake, and this, on, this is on the auxiliary port. You just delay it by the closing by a couple of degrees, nothing too major. And it also helps get more air in per stroke. And we also do the exhaust port. We make it open just a little bit earlier. Again, more chance of the exhaust gases getting out effectively. Furthermore, we do a bit of polishing on the intake ports as well. And it's mainly on the uh, secondary ports, which is this one here. They're both on the front and rear iron, and then the primary port's on the center iron. Mm -hmm. Now, the primary port has the biggest change in terms of timing. Again, only by a fraction of a degree, really. But, and that's the uh, port that requires the most work in terms of polishing. As you can see, nice and smooth on the inside. Yeah, it looks really good. It just smooths out airflow. Now, if you go too smooth, if you go too polished, that can be bad in some regards, just because fuel and air has to mix and it has to be a bit of a boundary layer. If that's not there, then it just pulls in the bottom of the port, basically. If it's too smooth, then the air isn't turbulent enough to mix with the... That's right, yeah. Right. For street ports, it takes about six hours, generally speaking. Yeah. Uh, for anything beyond that, like a full bridge or a race extension, that can take a full day just because there's a bit more work uh, involved. There's a lot more uh, precision with the cutting of the Dremel and things like that. Okay, so street porting and polishing, how will that affect power and efficiency? It all depends on what you've got bolted onto the car. For a stock car, street ports, uh, there's a nice noticeable increase in the later stages of the red range. It focuses mainly on the mid range up to the uh, top of the range. And then as for a bridge port, it's basically an, an extra port for the intake. Yeah. And that allows even more air to come in and that aids the uh, engine in terms of breathing well past 7,000 RPM. Here we've got Apex seals land out. They're yep. brand new, genuine Mazda ones, which are the only ones we recommend. If it was a bridge port, we'd have to actually change them to something like a goopy Apex seal, just because the corner piece has a, a bit more height to it, and that prevents it from falling into the port. Sure, yeah, like discussed last week. Yes, and obviously, 
apex hill springs there, long and short, and then just uh, Torrington bearings there that goes uh, on the e-shaft, the, uh, the front stack we call it. Yeah. And that's got various spaces and drive gears for your oil pump and OMP and things like that. Perfect. Awesome. Right, so I guess all that's left to do now is to grab the engine stand and then piece this big Meccano set together and then put it into the car and then brap brap all the way home. <laughs> no yeah. braps. No braps. You chickened out, you. So yeah, flip the front iron upside down. So now uh, we've got the front stack gear. It's the first thing that goes on. And we give it a nice, healthy serving of lube. Look at that. Spread it all around, nice even coverage. I tend to wipe just a little bit around the edge as well. Help it slide into the, uh, into the bore. Now sometimes this will require tapping. Go. and then we grab a bolt just the one bolt to hold it in place otherwise i'll flip this around and it'll fall out <laughs> back round first things first more lube now put lube on the face as a, a means to protect everything during its first startup if we were to put it on dry obviously there'd be a lot of friction as it's turning over and then before any of the engine oil gets into the critical areas like the bearings it just sees solid or do a lot of damage <laughs> now the rotor same again healthy supply of engine lube all the way around the bearing just before i lay the rotor down i get an old apex seal to fit into the recess of the uh, apex seal channel and run it along the corner seals just to make sure they're properly aligned because when you lay it down you can't turn it otherwise you disturb all the seals you don't want to risk it otherwise the rotor will have to come out again and because it's all caked in vaseline it'll uh, it'll all stick to the front iron and then you'll have to reassemble it all and that's that now there's no right or wrong as to how to lay it just as long as the gears meet i tend to have it pointed horizontally and then i'll tweak it just a little bit and once again, I make sure that the corner seals are aligned, just so the apex seal slides right in. Next comes the e-shaft. Bearings are already lubricated, so it should just go straight in with no resistance. There we go. Once again, as a precautionary measure, just to make sure the corner seals are aligned. Couple of dowels. I just put a bit of uh, regular engine oil on them. This just helps the housing to slide onto them. Again, without any resistance. Just put them in there. Just give them a little rub of some oil. Okay now, housing. I've already put the coolant seals in and we're gonna apply some silicon sealant on the feet. Just a nice little bead on the feet right there, right on the uh, sealant channels. like that and then we lay the housing down using the dowels as a guide there we go the magical moment that everyone seems to love apex seals so basically what you do is you make sure if you're using stock mazda seals i guess it doesn't really matter which way it goes in but um, one good thing to know is uh end of the corner seal that has the uh, corner piece attached to it has a purple uh, mark on it and that tells you to make it face upwards so put it in there only just a little bit then you put the big spring and rest it on the little foot of the apex seal and it's important to note the orientation of the big spring as well yes make sure it's uh curved outwards and then what you want to do is slide it in partially grab the small spring thank you and just sort of sandwich it in between and what you want to do slide it into position and what i do is i slide it up uh, on that part of the apex seal just so i know it's not overstepped the mark so to speak so so the the little spring there 
Yep. Does that act more of a kind of helper spring for the larger spring? That's right, yeah. Um, if, it, if you just had the larger spring, um, certainly on these particular engines, um, just because of how hot they run, that would quite quickly lose its tension. Yeah. Um, and that's why it has a, a little one just to support it. One of the reasons why it does lose compression is because they get weak and as they get weak, the uh, apex seal gets shorter as well. And obviously having the centre of the apex seal not being lubricated probably doesn't help as well, does it? And that's right, um, which is one of the reasons why we advise pre-mixing, um, just adding a bit of two-stroke oil to your fuel tank when you fill up. Just helps prolong the life of the apex seal more than anything else. So with the springs in place, we just slide it down. Right down to the bottom. Maybe I should have a go. <laughs> you can certainly have a go if you want. Jack's shaking his head. Why are you shaking your head? <laughs> Do you Jack? want to be the reason why this engine packs up? I want to be the reason why this engine packs up. Okay, I, I want you to have a go now. All right. Yeah, please have a go, honestly. So, we're looking for the purple mark. Yeah. That faces upwards. Mm -hmm. So let's put him in a little bit. Do you think I've already caused complete engine failure? I do. <laughs> so he slides like so. Yep. Just make sure that uh, the top of the spring is actually inside. Into the, yep. Yeah, that's it. There we go. He's happy. All right. So I have my little. Hold on to that. Help slide spring. it down just a little bit. Slide this. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Get going. Okay, that should be just about it. Get him in there. Oh, look that's at that. I think that's... Are we in there? And then lift it up. Because we're not, we're not in there, are we? We need to... Uh, you want to push the apex seal down a little bit more. Um, we're good there, no? Just a bit more. So basically, pinch the, if you can, pinch the... Uh, the short spring and slide that up along the apex seal, if that makes sense. Yeah, there we go. All right, now slide on in. All the way to the bottom. That's it. There we go. So for anyone who will be owning this car in the future, if your engine fails, you're welcome. It was probably that apex seal there that <laughs> failed. <laughs> Are you feeling the pressure yet? I'm feeling a little loose. Oh, that was a lovely little click there. In it goes. Reason number two for engine failure. That apex seal there. All right, make note of this. This is a front rotor. So if you have uh, apex seal failure on the uh, front rotor, apex seals are in. Yep. So now we apply a little bit of silicon sealant again. We get that, ugh, that discharge. I hate discharge. <laughs> Do you want to do my bath? I'll do your bath. I'm a, I'm a man of multiple trades, me. Now this is what some people would class as the, uh, the tedious part of engine assembly. The center iron. So obviously it's not just going to go straight on, is it? But before that, we need to apply a little bit of lube. Some people just apply it like this onto the, uh, onto this side of the rotor. Mm -hmm. When you say some people, you mean you? I actually <laughs> apply it onto the iron because it's no different to applying it onto the front. And, you know, it's proper clingy stuff is assembly lube, so you don't really run the risk of it running down. This is a tedious bit because some people just get stuck. So like, they'll get to this point and be like, what do I do now? Sometimes people get a second person to do it, but we've done this enough times that we just do it like that. <laughs> it's all dependent on how you position the rotor on the iron. What I tend to do is, if it's like this, um, I have the rotor pointing towards the, uh, the ports, basically. As the uh, center iron comes down, it tilts like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's just enough space for it to lift the e-shaft a little bit and it won't actually contact uh, where the sealant is. Almost there. Almost there. There we go. Nice. You can use a little uh, soft hammer for this, which is what I normally do, but I'm a big man now. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, same process. Start with the old uh, assembly lube. Yep. And also make note when you're uh, applying 
assembly lube to the irons. Make sure it doesn't go onto the water channels. Right, so more dowels, more lube on the dowel. <laughs> You'll have to make note of uh, which direction your rotor's pointing underneath because that determines how the opposite rotor's gonna face. It's a nice, simple engine to work on. There's no tap hits or anything like that. There's plenty of enthusiasts that enjoy doing little home builds and things like that. Like you? Yeah. The experience comes from clearancing and things like that. Yeah. Not everyone knows how to use a feeler gauge or there's varied opinions on how to use them, but we've built enough engines now and yeah, we've yeah. you know, cut a lot of side seals and uh, we, we just know what fits best and what sort of clearance to go for depending on the application. Not just with RX-8s, but with RX-7s and... Yeah, so for street driven, RX-8s, the side seals would be longer um, than a race car, right? Yes, that's right. Think of it as like um, piston rings. If it's, uh, if it's an engine that's not going to see much stress or the odd spirited drive, then you would generally go tighter in terms of clearance. If it was a big motor with, uh, well, big power engine with uh, nitrous turbo of like copious amounts of boost, then you'd go a little bit shorter. Um, you'd have a little bit more clearance. Only downside to that is obviously a bit of blow by, but if you generate enough heat inside the combustion chamber, they close up. What you want to do is make sure the gear of the rotor is facing where the gear, uh, the stationary gear goes in. So in this case, on a, on a simple two rotor engine, you want to make sure the gears face outwards of the engine, front yep. and back. Yep. So yeah, in this case, it'll be up like this. The gear will be facing us just because when we put the iron on the gear, goes through the iron mm -hmm. and it simply acts as a guide for the rotor. Nice. And again, just make sure the corner seals are properly aligned to uh, prevent any inconveniences when sliding the apex seals in. And we're back again. All right, here we go, that's nice. That's a nice solid bead that, isn't it? That's what you want, you want a good solid bead? Yeah, I like solid things. Oh, so, here we go. Boom. Oh, look at us, we're tag teaming the rotor. <laughs> Jack, why are you exhaling so loudly? Because I can just see you fumbling around with it. Yeah, that. no, I'm really, really, really going to town on this one. This one's broken, it's stuck. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix it. We're gonna have to edit this so it makes it look like I'm less of an idiot. <laughs> Impossible. I think we need a hammer. <laughs> we can't Should do that. Get okay, a hammer, do that, just drill it in. I had one job. <laughs> I was so looking forward to putting that one in. It's not your fault. Being the reason that another rotor housing exploded. As tight as a tiger. That's going to be love in life at 9,000 RPM on the way home. <laughs> 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 nah, it'll just be, it'll just be from where the rotor's uh, yeah. sat. Nothing major. More about the bead. Once again with a lube. Yeah. Some people do it like this. Like Picasso and Salt Bay. <laughs> <laughs> I like to do it like this. Or both. There's no Or both, yeah. There's nothing wrong with both. There's, there's no right or wrong. There's there's not as long as there's you, some lube. Yeah, you go both ways. And right. that's that's fine. That's the world we live in. We it we is. all go both ways. Well, some of us more than others. Right. So say goodbye to uh Young 13B. All right. You behave yourself. We have touchdown. Don't forget this, like I did on my first ever <laughs> home build. And that is? That is the seal for the rear stack gear. Because if you don't have that, you'll lose oil pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of lube. And then we make sure that is aligned with the keyway here. Lovely. There we go. Cool. But we're not done just yet. We're not. We need to seal the deal. Yeah. All of the tension bolts. What I do is I apply a bit of oil to the end of the threads. Just take away any friction yeah. upon assembly. In a bit. Goodbye. See ya.
adios. And then we do the same with all the rest of them. All 18 tension bolts hold this block together. Get in there, you. So initially I just uh, seat them in like that. Have you noticed I'm doing a pattern? So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. We start at 29 newton meters, and we go to 34 newton meters, and then we do 39. And the reason why it's in three stages is because you could do all of these the first time round to, uh, I don't know, say 25 newton meters. And then when you go back to the bolt you started at, it wouldn't be that torque anymore. It's just because it's not being torqued down all at once, so there's, there's stages. It's pretty boring, is this? Yeah, it really is, yeah. <laughs> oh, did you hear that pop in there? Yeah. That is the corner piece breaking away from the main body of the apex seal. Oh, is it? Yeah, they're held down with uh, like super glue oh. from factory, just so obviously it makes it easier to assemble. All the aftermarket apex seals, they don't actually come with them bonded, they come separate. If you lose that tiny little bit, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there goes another. So you've got another pass and then a final pass, right? That's right, yep. All right, so now we've got to secure the rear stack gear using these 12 mils. I usually apply a little bit of Loctite on them, even though they have a spring washer to help hold them in place. It's just a bit of security there. What's the torque setting? The torque setting is 22 newton meters, and it's the same for the front gear as well despite the bolts being slightly longer. There we go. So, yep, just tapping a keyway in place. Just like that. Flywheel, all clean, no clutch dust. All right, so we put a bit of sealant on the flange of this uh, flywheel nut, just because Mazda said so. Happy days. In your gore. All right, so flywheel locking tool does what it says on the tin. Mazda specifies for this flywheel nut between 390 and 490 newton meters. More torque than the engine. <laughs> there we go. You want to hear that before you start struggling. <laughs> Flip it real good. All right, now this is the part where we do the front stack. So that bolt we put in, we take it out now because there's no risk of it falling out. I got some Lynx shower gel in my eye last night. Really <laughs> stings, like really bad. Almost as bad as petrol. Is that an integral part of this engine build? No, it's just yeah. a conversation. <laughs> I think just it's good to know though. Okay, so we've got the uh, front spacer. This is the first thing you put on. I just put a bit of oil in there. Any orientation for the spacer? No, you can spin it however you want. This is the thing we might have to play around with. End play, but obviously we, we measure it once it's all stacked, so it goes on here. You guess it. Bit more lube. Bit more oil. You know what, I'm, feel I'm feeling lucky today. I'm gonna go for a C. C, C what? C spacer. They are graded from uh, A to E. A giving you the least movement and then E giving you most. All right, so we'll put that down there. Then comes your Torrington bearing. I have no idea who Torrington is. We spin it like a little bay blade, make sure there's oil in it. Then we've got this plate has to go on before you bolt the gear down. Goes right here. There we go. There we go. Similar to the, the rear Loctite on these bolts. Shove them right in. Another Torrington. It's uh, support for the counterweight spinning. I've seen the bearings fall out. Oh really? Um, but that's on some like proper chronic bearing failure engines. 
there is a, a little spacer on here. Just put that on there, just so it stays on basically when I flip it upside down. I'll just stick this on for good measure. Whoop. Keyway, then this is the oil pump drive gear. And then the OMP drive gear. Bit of persuasion. <laughs> there we go. Nice. Just a little bit of persuasion. And then what I do now is put the front pulley on. Obviously, this isn't the assembly. This is uh, this is just having a stack assembled so I can measure end play. Okay. If, if all is good. Yep. And I just take a few bits off and then uh, assemble the oil pump and all that. If not, then. I just have to change the, uh, you know, that spacer I was telling you about with the letters on it. Yeah. Just switch them up. A bit of grease, assembly loom, just to prevent friction. Wind on in. All right, so the front bowl is not as high as the rear nut. I must to say, torque it's 300 newton meters for testing the end play. Why did I say it like that? They're not American. All right, so I've set up the dial gauge. And what we're doing here is measuring the end play of the full rotating assembly. And what we're looking for? A lot more movement than that. <laughs> we are currently getting a reading of 0 0.01 of a millimetre, which is pretty tight. We want to be seeing something between 0.04 mil and 0.09. So we've got to have uh, a bit more clearance, so we have to go on to a couple of sizes more. We've got a C spacer in there, so we'll probably have to go for a D or an E. Get out the D. All right, so once again, check in the uh, end play. It's about right. About six, is it? Point six? Yeah, thereabouts. Because I'm happy with that. A well pump. This is uh, increasing base oil pressure at idle. And then we put a healthy dose of lube in there. Making sure the oil is everywhere. And I just uh, lube the shaft. There you go, you go in there. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice little keyway in there. So we've got our oil pump drive gear and the other gear for it as well. This gear goes on the e shaft and this one goes on top of the oil pump. No timing involved. They literally just go straight on. So uh, yeah, f you pistons. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take this key out of the e shaft just so I've got free rotation. Now you want to take absolute caution when you're putting this on because uh, what happens is the keyway keeps sliding down, ha ha! So what you got to do is uh, position it towards the bottom of the engine, get it ready, and then use a long screwdriver or a pick just to hold it in place. Oh, that's more like it. And just look through the uh, little window to make sure that the keyway is still in place, and you're all good. Next step is put the e-shaft keyway in, slide it right down. Oh, I've timed up a rotary. What even is timing? Yeah. So the OMP drive gear can now go on which stands for oil metering pump. And you've got to put the nut and washer on the gear. They're That's fine good. to reuse. Yeah. Torque it up for extra security, all the way up to 42 Newton meters. And then fold the old washer in. Just holds the nut in. So if ever it decides to undo itself, it can't because that's there. So we're happy that's tight. This is all stacked appropriately. Let's put the gasket on. The front cover just sits there. But before we do this, you don't have to do that, I just do it. <laughs> you can never have enough oil in a rotary. Exciting times. That right there is your oil metering pump drive. So this shaft connects to that on the e shaft and is basically an outlet there for the uh, OMP. And obviously, it's constantly driven by the engine. Uh, the faster the engine revs, the more it injects, but it's also controlled electronically. How much work it actually does, I don't know. Just nice to know it's there. Front cover on, get the bolts. Nothing fancy here, just a simple nut and bolt job. No tightening procedure here. 
this is the part where there isn't a, such a thing as torque. Okay, it's a pulley on. Right now, before we put this spring in the E shaft, just want to show you what goes in after it. This is a thermal bypass pellet. When the engine's cold, it's open like this, and that prevents oil from flowing through the E shaft to the bearings. As it warms up, it opens up and allows free movement of oil. This solid aluminium one is basically in the always open position, so you get all the oil, all of the time, hot or cold. It's just something that most rebuilders tend to put in um, as standard just because. You want oil flowing through at all times. That's right, yeah. So this is the front pulley bolt for the engine. I put a new O-ring on the end of it. Before you screw this into the E-shaft, you actually apply a little bead of sealant all the way around the outer edge, just to prevent oil from coming out. When you're just putting the bolt in, just to measure end play, 300 newton meters, but otherwise 290. So that's pretty much that. And then just got to put the sump on, just scraping the excess sealant off to make for a flat surface to, uh, for the sump to bond onto. This is the new oil pickup with a new gasket, straight on there, two 10 mils. And away you go. Here's your freshly clean sump. Bit of a Picasso action here. All right, so once this is bolted down, we just go straight to putting the ancillaries on. Job done. So that's how you uh, rebuild a 13B rotary. That's the one. Now all that's left to do is to reinstall all the ancillaries, fit a new clutch because the old one was buggered, and then wheel the brand new rotary engine back over to Felix for the final step. Right, so now that the engine has been put together, it is time to put said engine into the car and then I'm going to drive off into the sunset like Thelma and Louise, except just Thelma because I have no friends. Uh, Josh, are you um, ready to go? Josh? <laughs> okay, I'm going to go over here. Let's get this bad boy in. <laughs> So it is now 7.37 in the evening. You've been working on this car for like seven hours. <laughs> Sterling job. Uh, engine's in, everything's in. Oil, coolant. Now is the moment of the truth. Now we're gonna fire up this RX-8 engine for the very first time. It's fresh. What are we expecting? To start first time? Sometimes the idle hunt a little bit. Other times it'll go straight up to where it normally is. Um, that's what I'm expecting just because it's a street port. Sometimes there's quite a lot of smoke where it fills the workshop. Um, other times it's just like a noticeable amount of smoke coming out. Yeah. And that's basically all your uh, assembly lubricants and Vaseline burning off. Vaseline! <laughs> anyway, uh, let's not get sidetracked. It's, it's all yours, man. It's all yours. Go for it. Let's do this. I'm going to drive home with an engine that's happy. Hopefully, touch wood. Oh! You, got, you didn't fix that today, did you? Nah. Not this time. We have takeoff. Oh my God, how smooth does that sound? That is so smooth. So smooth. Oh, listen to that. That is lovely. Awesome. <laughs> Took a little while to get there. And look, we've got our own smoke machine. Look at that. Yeah, man. 
That is so smooth. <laughs> Come here, man. That's insane. Hey! Oh, Josh from Rotary Revs, everyone. He's done it in a day. That's amazing. Impressive. Really impressed. All there's left to do now is to put the bonnet back, put the wheels on, and yeah. then for me to drive home 279 miles. <laughs> uh, I've got to be a little bit careful, don't I? I can't thrash it or anything like that. That's right. There is a running in procedure, which is a thousand miles of uh, driving keeping it under 5,000 RPM with varying loads. Yeah. Um, and then come back for an oil change. Amazing, we'll do that. I hope you guys enjoyed this very successful episode of Living with a Rotary. Don't forget you guys can check out the rest of the series by clicking here. You can subscribe to Car Throttle over here. And don't forget to check out the Car Throttle shop down there. See you next week.